Sorbonne, what is it? Why is it? What can you do? We'll get your environment set up. We'll go through a Hello World example, just what does a basic Sorbonne contract look like? How do you write it? We'll go through a more end-to-end -end example, like a full app of how do you actually build an experience that users are going to love. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about where we're going to go, uh, how you can get involved. Um, so first, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Paul. I'm an engineer at SDF, formerly at Horizon, uh, and now I'm super excited to be working on Sorbonne. So why is Sorbonne such an advancement over, or such a great addition to Stellar Vanilla? Um, so at initial look, there's a few basic naming differences. Uh, so on Sorbonne, we call them tokens. On Stellar Vanilla, we call them assets, right? Um, they're kind of two sides of the same thing. But really, it's about a whole new set of powerful tools that you can use. Stellar Vanilla, you know, you can do exchanges, you can do payments. But if you want to do anything more complicated, you need some code running somewhere on a trusted third party, and you need to trust them not to change it on you. Uh, with Sorbon, the smart contracts run in the network, right? So they can make decisions, they can store data, they can control tokens programmatically. And I think most importantly for me, they provide reliable neutrality. Uh, the code is all on chain and it can't change once it's deployed. So you know that what you're doing is what you think you're doing. Uh, so what can you do with this? Uh, there's a few ideas, you know, I thought of while I was writing this talk. I'm sure you guys have a lot better ones. Um, you can do more granular trust and authentication, any sort of token transfer off you want, delegation, time locks, stuff like that. Uh, you can do voting. Uh, right now there's a project, I forget the name of, that does voting via claimable balances, which like works, but it's like not quite the right tool for the job. Um, whereas like you can do voting with this super easily. You can do any custom token design you want to do. Um, there's even a user writing a zero-knowledge proof engine, which is like, I don't understand, uh, but it's super cool. Um, and you can do stuff like crowdfunding, which is what we'll look a bit at today. Um, right now, Sorbonne does have limited interoperation with Stellar Vanilla. The one thing you can do is that you can wrap and use all of the existing Stellar assets. Um, so you deploy a token on the Sorbonne side that wraps the asset from the Vanilla side, and it gives a native interface for contracts to interact with those assets and import them from the Vanilla. Cool, uh, there's a few things you can't do. Um, smart contracts cannot initiate any interaction. They can't communicate with anything off chain. Everything has to be on chain. Um, this is where you get oracles, uh, things like that. Um, basically, the only way to invoke a smart contract code is to submit a transaction to the network. So someone or some server outside needs to make it happen first. Um, and because it's a smart contract, all the data and code are public. Uh, encryption and other shenanigans like that aside, anything you put into the contract, code or data, anyone can read. Um, they also need to be optimized for size and speed, right? They're running on every validator in the network. So if you want to run big, expensive things, it's going to be expensive and then slow, right? Um, so we've got to make them fast and small. Um, and they're immutable. So once they're deployed, the code can't change. The data can change, but the code can't. Um, for upgradability, there's a few patterns you can use, like routers and proxies, but we're not going to talk about that today because it's a bit more advanced. OK, so I want to uh, say everything we're talking about here today will be at sorbonne.stellar.org. A little bit closer. OK. Oh, there we go. Uh, everything we're talking about today will be at sorbonne.stellar.org. Um, you can find out everything there, all the tutorials, all the examples, everything we're going to go through will be there. So uh, let's get your environment set up. So the first thing we need to do uh, is that uh, smart contracts in Sorbonne are written in WebAssembly. Um, that means you can technically write them in any language that compiles to WebAssembly, like TinyGo or AssemblyScript or Zig or Rust or whatever. Um, the official SDK right now is in Rust. Um, upside of that is the whole stack is written in Rust, right? The Sorbonne runtime and backend is all in Rust. The smart contracts are in Rust. The whole thing is in Rust. Um, OK, at least somebody's happy about that. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is just the standard Rust install script that they give you on Rust up uh, to install Rust. That's all normal. We do need to teach it how to, how to compile for WebAssembly, though. So we add a target, Rust up target add, WASM32. Um, and that's our Rust environment set up. The second thing we need to set up is called Sorbon CLI. So this is a CLI tool. It's kind of a multi-tool Swiss Army knife for developing, deploying, and managing your contracts. This is kind of like the entry point, right? Um, so get that installed. I think this is the latest version. Check on sorbon.stellar.org. There might be a new one released. Um, and the third thing we want to do, uh, we're going to go through some example contracts. So we can clone down the example contract repo. Uh, we want to, uh, for later on, we'll also need Docker uh, to run the standalone network uh, and connect to FutureNet, which we'll talk about in a sec. 
Um, but at that point, then you can just start coding in Rust in whatever your favorite editor is. Um, you probably want a Rust plugin that's like super helpful if you're new to Rust. Um, yeah. Okay, so at that point, our environment is all set up. Uh, let's go through the example repo, uh, which is this one if you want. Cool, and is, yeah. So uh, this is the examples repo. Is that big enough? Yeah, that's big enough. Cool. Um, so there's all sorts of example contracts for everything in here from authentication, advanced authentication, like writing a liquidity pool, um, how do you deal with events, single offers, time locks, everything, right? Um, this is a super good uh, cookbook, basically, when you're first learning how to write Starbucks contracts. And if you have, like, how do I do authentication? Like, you can go look in here and just, like, grab it for your own contract. Um, let's look through the Hello World one, just super simple. Come on, conference Wi-Fi. There we go. Uh, so we can see that it's just a standard Rust library, right? There's nothing, nothing super fancy about it, aside from importing the Sorbonne SDK. Uh, let's look at the code. Come on. Hey. This is what I get for trying to do a live demo. <laughs> Haven't even got to the interesting bit yet. Okay, uh, plan B. <laughs> okay, um, so if we look at the code in the library, library here, here we go. Um, so this is kind of the most basic uh, Sorbonne contract that you can write. Um, first off, we import the SDK, right? Um, we define a contract implementation. Uh, I haven't built it yet. Okay, define the contract implementation with a single method called hello uh, that has a single public function to it. Um, it takes a symbol and returns a vector of symbols, uh, like an array in other languages um, you may be more familiar with, um, and just says hello, and then whatever you passed in just echoes it back out. So a symbol is a special Sorbonne type uh, that's like a string of 10 characters or less, which is useful because it lets us do some optimization in the compiler around that. So if you have like a map where you're storing a bunch of different things, a symbol is a really good choice for the key. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so that's a symbol for that. We also, because it's a standard Rust contract, right, um, we can also open up the tests for it, uh, and we can use all the standard Rust testing library stuff in here. Um, there is, uh, yeah, so for the example test here, uh, we create a new runtime environment uh, for Sorbonne. We register our contract in it. We create the client to talk to that contract. Um, if you were calling another contract, this is how you would do it call the hello, uh, and then verify some stuff out the other end. So we wanted to make uh, testing super easy um, because you know you don't want to deploy a smart contract without some testing, right? That's like not a great idea. Um, the also really cool thing in here is because it runs a standard Rust, you can actually use debuggers. Um, so if you have like big complicated cross-contract queries you're doing, you can just do a Rust debugger and step through it, um, which is awesome. Um, there is one other bit uh, I want to talk about quickly before we move off of this. Um, this no no standard thing. Um, so part of making the contract smaller, faster, uh, compile better is we don't use the standard library uh, in Sorbonne contracts. We don't really need it. Um, the design of Sorbonne is such that most things you want to do um, happen actually on the host outside your contract. Um, so like vector appends and all that kind of stuff. Um, serialization, deserialization. This means we can optimize those, uh, which makes it much faster and cheaper than uh, other smart contract platforms. So we provide a lot of those things that the standard library would do in the SDK, like result types and option types um, and those types of things. Again, check the examples for, uh, for that. OK, so we have our Hello World. So step one, OK. Uh, in the examples uh, repository, there is a make file. So we can do make build. I did this earlier, so it should be fairly quick, but it'll take just a second because there's a fair amount of contracts in here to build. And then once we've done that, we can start using the Sorbonne uh, CLI to deploy it and play around with it and try stuff out. Cool, so we're good with that. So the Sorbonne, Sorbonne here we go, CLI tool has a bunch of different uh, stuff it can do. Um, you can invoke, so you can call methods on contracts. You can inspect them and like print out the type signature for it. Uh, you can create and manage tokens on the network, uh, deploy contracts, a bunch of other stuff. So let's uh, start with the deploy, and then we'll invoke. 
So we can do Sorbonne deploy, and we give it our WASM, which is going to be uh, in Rust, everything gets compiled into target, WASM32, uh, and then our Sorbonne Hello World contract dot WASM. OK, so that has deployed it into what we call the sandbox, uh, the local development environment. Um, and it's generated me a random uh, contract ID. So if we want to actually invoke that now, we can do invoke function. Uh, and then we'll say method hello, sorry, no, function. I have typoed that. OK, so we want to give it the contract ID, the function we want to call. And we can pass in an arc here. And we'll say hello, Marie. Cool. Um, so Whoa. that's not the cool bit yet. <laughs> cool. So what that just did, right? So it loaded up the sandbox environment, loaded up our contract in it, uh, interpreted the args that we passed on the command line into XDR, injected them into the contract, ran the whole thing, gave me the result back, and updated the sandbox if there was new like storage stuff in there, right? Um, a few nice things to know in here, uh, there's this double dash arg flag. So certain uh, common arguments like uh, strings and symbols and numbers, uh, you can just pass with arg as a string. If you want to do more complicated stuff, there's a arg xdr, and you can pass it as xdr, which is more convenient for some stuff. Um, but we kind of want to make this experience like nice and easy to get started with. Um, so what do I mean when I say sandbox? I mean, where did my slides go? OK, so there are five deployment environments uh, to know about. Three of them are ready right now. Uh, right now is Sandbox, which is a local uh, file system. It creates a .sorbon folder in your project directory, uh, and it stores everything as just .json files in there. So you can actually go in and poke around and have a look at the storage under the hood, uh, which is nice. Um, there is Standalone, which is a Docker image quick start that runs a uh, local Stellar network on your machine. It's a little bit more realistic than the sandbox, uh, so it kind of goes down that path. And then there's FutureNet, which is live today. Um, so you can connect to that also via Quick Start, which, uh, if the Wi-Fi works, we'll do again in a second here. Um, Testnet and PubNet, not ready yet, not supporting uh, Sorbonne at the moment. Cool. So that is the Hello World bit. Let's move on to something a little bit more interesting, because that didn't do any storage, it didn't actually, you know, do that much of an interesting contract. Cool. Uh, and the first thing I need to do, this can take a second to start up. So let's get that going while we talk about what we're doing here. OK, so this is the example app. It's a full end-to-end -end app that has contract uh, and a web app that interact with each, with each other to show you how to build a full experience out of this thing. Uh, it looks a bit like this. It's a single crowdfund, um, a bit like Kickstarter or Indiegogo or something like that, but just like a one-off, right? Um, so, yep. It is currently a Next.js app, uh, but that's not actually required. It's just, I like Next.js, <laughs> so I built it in Next.js. Uh, a lot of the actual magic is happening in a package called Sorbonne Client, uh, which is now here. Uh, this is kind of the partner to, uh, there was a package called Stellar uh, SDK on NPM. This is kind of the Sorbonne bit to that. Uh, it's a client for the Sorbonne RPC server. And what do I mean Sorbonne RPC? What is this thing, right? Uh, let's, man, I really got to figure out how to switch these slides better. All right, here we go. So the architecture of kind of a decentralized app uh, on Sorbonne, there's a few different moving bits here uh, that we want to talk about. First off is kind of the web app. This is the the nice screen we were just looking at, where it has the crowdfund thing, showing stuff to the user. Now, if you want to actually submit a transaction and write stuff into the chain, you want to invoke the contracts, you'll use the Sorbonne client JS library to build a transaction. You'll send it off to Sorbonne RPC to simulate the transaction and get back a result from that. Now, Sorbonne RPC is kind of the Sorbonne counterpart to Horizon. It's a bit smaller, um, a little bit more focused, uh, Horizon kind of defaults to indexing everything for everyone on the entire chain, right? If Sorbonne starts growing, that's not going to like scale super well. So we wanted to make it easier to scale, easier to maintain, cheaper to run uh, for you guys. The default is just you can subscribe to things that you care about um, specifically. Like if you want to track the USDC contract, you can say, give me all the transfers for USDC on Sorbonne RPC and maintain it that way. Transaction simulation. 
so transaction submission is kind of a two-part process on Sorbon, right? Um, as part of performance, each transaction comes with uh, a footprint, which is a list of all the storage locations that it reads or that it writes. This lets us bucket the transactions based on what they need to do so that we can parallelize them without where ones don't interact with each other. So we get kind of different lanes based on like what storage they use. So we can do the simulation to figure out the footprint for us. It basically runs it and says, all right, here's your footprint, um, and here's how much it costs to run, and here's what we expect the result to be at the other end. So you can check that your, check that your transaction is actually gonna succeed before you spend the funds to submit it, right? Cool, so you do the simulate, you get it back, you send it up to the wallet to get signed. Wallet asks the user, hey, is this what you wanna do? User says yes, and then we can do send transaction as per normal. Um, one other note here, uh, send transaction for Sorbonne RPC. Uh, on Horizon, you would call send transaction and then it would just pause until you got the result back. Here, Sorbonne RPC says, yep, got it, it's in the queue. And then you have to go and ask it for the status later on. Um, again, a scalability thing. Um, cool, so that's how you would submit and write a transaction to the chain to change stuff. If you wanna read stuff uh, from the chain and display it in your app, there's three different ways. The first is again, simulate transaction. Uh, it returns you the result of the transaction. So if you have a getter in your contract, like let's say show me the balance of such and such a user, you can do a transaction that would simulate that, simulate it off-chain, get the result back, and display that out. Um, that gives you the current version. Uh, it's kind of a cheap and cheerful way to do it. The second way is get contract data. So again, smart contract stuff is all public. You can read any piece of data for any contract if you want. It's a bit lower level. You can actually just go in and fetch the XDR for that data. Um, it lets you access any piece of data, even if the contract doesn't have a getter built already for that, you can still just go do it. Um, but you might need to do a little bit of like massaging to get it into a nice format for the users at the other end. And the way I'm most excited about uh, is events subscribe. So in the contract, you can emit events as things happen. Like let's say uh, you do a token transfer, there can be a transfer event. Um, you can subscribe to those for certain contracts and you'll get a push notification whenever that happens um, out to your app. That's not quite ready yet. Uh, we're still working on the design for that. But I think that's, uh, it's probably the most scalable and the fastest and the nice user experience is that that's the way to go long-term. Uh, and then, you know, you can render the data from the web app. Cool. Let's actually, uh-oh, that's the word. Okay, that's a scary word. Uh, let's see if this is running now. Okay, so um, one thing, holy crap, it's working. Uh, <laughs> so I shouldn't be as surprised as I am. Um, one thing to note here is uh, the wallet right now, actually, there was a new release of Freighter uh, yesterday, maybe. Um, you should go and download that. It is version 2.6.0. Uh, it's now in the Chrome App Store. Uh, if you Google that, uh, there's a, yeah, here you go, 2.6.0. Um, and within that, we need to enable uh, experimental mode to enable Sorbonne. So we can go into the gear, preferences, I think it is. Yeah, here you go, experimental mode. It's basically enable Sorbonne in Freighter if we want to test stuff with this. Okay. So in the example that, let's go through the contract quick, um, and then we will fire stuff up. Okay, so standard Next.js app, there's two contracts in here. There's a token spec for our client, and then the actual crowdfund backend. Again, standard Rust library. Cool. Uh, so again, it starts pretty similar to the other one. We import the SDK, we do no standard library. Uh, we import the token spec. This will generate our client to talk to the token contract on the network. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff to do with storage that I'm gonna skip for now. And we get down to the actual contract here, right? So the workflow we're gonna go through, you're gonna deploy the contract, call initialize on it with uh, who's the ultimate recipient for the crowdfund, uh, what's the deadline, what's the target amount we want to raise, and what's the token that we're going to accept. Donors can then come along and send token to the contract to deposit stuff, um, and once the target amount is reached, then the contract recipient will be able to withdraw all of the tokens, or if it expires before that's reached, the donors can come and withdraw what they deposited back to their initial, uh, back to their initial wallet. Right, so initialize uh, function here. Again, takes recipient, deadline, amount, token, all of that. Uh, this is kind of, uh, this is what the storage looks like. So we say that the contract data and then we set some stuff in it. So we set the recipient as this. Uh, we set the storage started timestamp as the current ledger timestamp. 
um, and so on. And we have a, just kind of a guard to prevent duplicate initialization if somebody else is, uh, tries to initialize it later. Um, there's a bunch of getters uh, that we could call by simulate transaction, um, like what time was this started, what's the current deadline, what's the current status of the thing, how much has this user deposited, any of that. Okay, so the meat and potatoes of the thing here is deposit and withdraw. Uh, so deposit, we're gonna take a user and an amount, check that we're in the right state, this, that the uh, crowd sale is still ongoing. <clears throat> we're gonna check uh, that the user who's depositing is not the recipient. We could allow that if we wanted to, but just more complicated, right? Like smart contracts 101, keep it simple. Um, so you can actually understand what you're doing. And then we check how much the user's already deposited and we add the new amount to the balance. And then we do the actual transfer on the token. Now, uh, you can kind of note that we're, we're doing this update into the storage to update how much they're, they've deposited before we do the transfer. That's okay, because the whole thing is atomic. So if the transfer fails, that'll get rolled back and the whole thing will be undone. Um, if we do it the other way around and do the transfer first, um, there's actually a, it's called a re-entrancy attack, basically. So there's actually a, a reason not to do that. Um, the rule is essentially you want to do all of your internal state updates and all of your external contract calls. You don't want to mix them. You want to do them either first or after, right? Um, that's kind of the rule of thumb uh, to avoid this type of thing. So the transfer from here, uh, we create the token client to connect to the token contract. We get the token ID that we're accepting, uh, the ID of the token contract, and transfer from takes a account to take it from, account to send it to, and an amount. Um, and then the authentication for this uh, is these two fields. Um, that takes a, a signature, uh, which is like a, if you're building a normal transaction and you sign it, it's like the same kind of thing. Um, and then a nonce to avoid replay stuff. Um, again, if you want more details of this, look in the auth contract um, example. We're not gonna talk too much about this, but it's a thing. Um, cool. So then once the sale is finished, we can withdraw. Uh, if it's still running, obviously do nothing. If it was successful, just transfer everything to the recipient. It, if it expired, look up how much this user deposited and just send everything back to them. Cool, that's pretty much it. That's the whole contract. Um, you're all Sorbonne engineers now. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so uh, the thing I started earlier is the quick start image. Uh, it is, here we go, uh, dot quick start future net. Um, there's two scripts in the example that I wanna specifically go through here quick. Um, there is, if I was actually in the example that repo, here we go. Uh, there is initialize and quick start, these two in red here. So quick start launches the Docker image that kind of simulates the network or connects to the real network in this case. Uh, and initialize, which does our contract deploy and initialize to set everything up. So the quick start here, um, it does a few extra bits to connect to FutureNet. Uh, sorry, that's not the right one. Sorry, the initialize here. Uh, we're gonna run initialize FutureNet um, and the reason we're gonna do that is that Sorbonne CLI has some extra environment variables or flags that it listens to to tell it which network am I connecting to, what am I doing here? So when we connect to FutureNet, we point it at the quick start image host. We give it the network passphrase. Um, so each network installer has a passphrase. The passphrase is used whenever you sign transactions so that if someone gets you to sign a transaction for testnet, they can't take it and run it in PubNet. <laughs> Super important security thing. So each network has its own passphrase. So there's a FutureNet passphrase, which is in here. And we give it a secret key, um, which is just, I generated on laboratory earlier, just for this. Like, you should probably have better key management when you're building proper things. Uh, particularly like hardware wallets is something we're looking at for Sorbonne. Cool. Uh, the initialize script is gonna create a token. This is how you create a new token on Sorbonne. It's not gonna be an asset wrapper. It's gonna be a Sorbonne native token. So it has to stay on the Sorbonne side, but that's like fine for now. There's also a token wrap command that takes a stellar asset and wraps it for you. Uh, we're gonna save the contract ID for the token, build stuff, deploy the crowdfund contract, and call initialize on it uh, to set it all up and stuff. So that's what the initialize script is gonna do. There is gonna be one error when I run it, which we'll talk about, because uh, I haven't fixed it yet. <laughs> Um, this, and it's gonna be right 
now. There we go. Uh, so it calls into FriendBot to fund the uh, admin account for this thing, but the admin account already exists. So FriendBot's like, oh, I can't do that. Don't worry about it. It won't break anything. It's just the account already exists on FutureNet because I ran this this morning. So cool. Let's deploy the contract. Initialized it. Cool, and we should be all good to go. So now in Next.js, we run the web server, npm run dev. So this will launch a web server on localhost 3000, which we can pull up here. Ah, okay, so before we can do that, there is one thing we also need to do, is we need to, let's do one of these. So when you first open the uh, this web app, it'll ask you if you want to connect to Freighter. It should only ask you once, I'm working on that. <laughs> Just ignore the other one, it's fine. Um, it'll ask if you want to connect to the Freighter wallet uh, that's installed in here. Uh, so we'll say, yes, I'm OK sharing this uh, address with the DAP. It won't do anything. It'll just uh, allow it to access the thing. OK, so we need to actually set up uh, Freighter correctly for stuff. So to do that for FutureNet, so there is a FutureNet and testnet that comes with Freighter out of the box when we're in experimental mode. This is actually designed to connect to like a public uh, FutureNet Horizon and Sorbon RPC. That doesn't exist yet. So we're going to use Quick Start. So we'll set it up for Quick Start for that. Okay. Um, so we will go into Add a New Network. Add custom. Let's go. Uh, yeah, here we go. Okay, we'll grab the passphrase because we'll need that. We're going to go to Add Custom Network, which is brand new in uh, Freighter. Thank you, PL. Um, so you can connect to local sandbox. So we'll do Future. FutureNet quick start to connect to our local one. It runs on localhost 8000. And then Sorbon RPC lives on Sorbon slash RPC, as you might expect, based on our passphrase. Um, because we're connecting to a local instance, we need to allow connecting to, to non HTTPS stuff. Um, for dev, it's fine. For production stuff, you should probably not do that. Um, and we want to switch to this network right away. Cool. So now uh, Freighter's all set up. We need to actually fund our account on FutureNet because you won't have any lumens otherwise. You can't submit new transactions. So we can go into laboratory, and there's a new button here called FutureNet. It says you're connected to the Sorbonne test network, so make sure that's all up. Create account. Paste in our address, and let's get some lumens. Cool. So we're all set up now. So now if we reload the DAP here. Here we go. So we've loaded now a bunch of data from the actual smart contract. The, we can see we're on FutureNet. This has come from Freighter. There's already been $0 deposited so far. Zero EXT, rather. Example token, not dollars. Um, of our goal, there's one day left that we set on the deadline. Uh, there's, I don't think this is loaded from the smart contract yet, because there has not been 976 backers yet. <laughs> that would be excellent. Um, and then for development, there's kind of there's one extra button here we've added. Um, we obviously need some example tokens in our wallet in order to deposit them. So we just have like a min me some example tokens button, right? So we can just click that. It'll go off and send us some tokens into our freighter wallet. Uh, so one gotcha at the moment, uh, when you're connected to a quick start image, uh, neither Lumens nor um, Sorbonne tokens will show up in your freighter wallet yet. We're working on that. It's not done yet. So, um, so you will not see your balance or anything change in the freighter wallet at the moment. It just does the signing. But we have the example tokens now. So we can do a proven transfer. So this will do two different transactions. It will send a token.approve. So we'll tell the token contract, I would like to allow the crowdfund to withdraw 100 EXT from my account. And then it will do the actual deposit on the crowdfund that says, hey, crowdfund, please go take this out of my account and, and ingest it, deal with it properly. Um, there's a few different payment flows. Uh, proven transfer is a fairly common one um, for DeFi apps. Uh, and there's pros and cons of each um, that I don't want to go into. So we'll see two, two, different, two different transactions come up. So this is approve. We're in experimental mode. We're on FutureNet. It's all good. Um, the displays here need some work, but it's cool. Uh, I need my. I need my freighter password. Cool. We'll approve that. And then we'll see another one come up here. And this is the actual deposit now. So we can prove that. Wait for the little spinner. Cool. There we go. 
So that's gone through and done the transfer. And we have 100 EXT depositing. Cool, so that is, as far as I know, the first smart contract on Sorbonne FutureNet, which is pretty cool, and it works, so yeah. Okay, so uh, this is kind of, uh, I just wanted to leave a quick summary of the slides of like configuring Sorbonne CLI to work with this stuff. This is what you would do for the standalone network. You do quick start standalone, configure it to talk to that network, fa network passphrase, set your secret key, all of that. Um, and there is a local friend bot as part of quick start uh, image when you're running standalone. So you can do the uh, friend bot funding for whatever local addresses to test stuff uh, locally as well. And the freighter side works similarly to how we just did it, but with standalone. So where are we going? Um, FutureNet is super early. <laughs> there is one smart contract on it now. So uh, hopefully that grows. Um, it's not designed for production applications. Don't go launching stuff, please, on it yet. <laughs> um, that's not a good idea. It's, uh, you know, it might be reset at any time, right? We're, I think we'll try and keep to a schedule of when we reset it, uh, but it might wedge itself. I might have to go and delete everything to get it going again, right? It's under development. Um, so uh, stuff will change, uh, but that also means you can change it. Uh, come join the discard, come you know, let us know what works well for you, what doesn't work well for you. Like we can make it how you, wanna, how you want it to be. That's kind of the point of the stage. The stage right now is you should go and experiment and tinker with it, try stuff out. Um, take part in the Sorbonnethon and yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, cool, I think the most exciting thing at this stage uh, for me is it's sort of a new ecosystem, but we get to leverage everything else on the Stellar network already. Like you have USDC for your new smart contracts out of the box, right? You can walk into MoneyGram, hand out some cash, and chuck it into DeFi, which is like pretty cool. Um, so we have like massive leverage already. I kind of, there's an analogy I've been using of like Stellar Vanilla is like a fine dining experience. It's like, you go into a nice restaurant and it's like perfect. As long as you want exactly what the chef is serving, it's like got everything you want, right? Whereas like Sorbonne is more of like a, it's like a family picnic, right? It's like a bit chaotic and like, but if you want something, you got to bring it. But like, if we all bring our best, then it's going to be amazing, right? It's going to be incredible. Cool. And I want to leave you uh, with uh, this again. Uh, everything we talked about is here. Links to Discord, links to the sorbonne -thon. Everything you need to know is there. Um, that's the kind of takeaway. Um, I will also be in the lounge right there, right after. If there's other questions or set up tech support, uh, we can do to make it better. Uh, and there's a brain date upstairs at 4 p.m. today. Um, if there's other stuff I can help you with, I'll be around all afternoon. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. I think, yeah, we have some time for questions and stuff if there are any. Sorry, I can't quite hear you. Oh, okay, so token wrapping and stuff. Um, if you want it to only be accessible from Sorbonne, or you don't care about it being accessible to Stellar Classic, you do token create, and that'll create a new token on the Sorbonne side. The other advantage is there is the token is essentially an interface. So if you want to implement stuff that's more programmatic into your token, like, I don't know, change the transfer fees or like whatever else you want to do, you should do it as a new token on Sorbonne. If you want it to be uh, accessible from the DEX and everything else on Stellar Vanilla, then you should do it as an asset and create a token wrapper. Um, the token wrapper basically forwards all the calls into the classic Stellar asset and exposes all of that as well. Um, one difference is there's no trust lines on Sorbon. Uh, so once you have it, you can just hold it and you can transfer it to whoever in that, on that side. But if you want to transfer it back to the Stellar asset side, um, what's called export, then you'll need the trust lines on the receiver to be able to receive and auth, auth required and all that kind of stuff on the receiver to be able to handle it. Is that okay? In the future, three years from now, you should help us figure that out. That would be awesome. Um, hmm. That is a good question. Um, there's pretty good arguments for both. I don't think vanilla is going away anytime soon. I think your safest bet, if you can do, is create a normal Stellar asset and wrap it with a token because it gives you the most flexibility. Uh, 
you know, unless you need to do programmatic stuff, or like you're writing your own custom token, you know. Yeah. Cool. Uh, any others? Let's go here then. Will it be possible to um, have multiple wrappers for to the same classic asset? No. So when you wrap a when you wrap a classic asset, the ID of the wrapper contract is determined by the by the asset you're wrapping. So it's completely deterministic. So there is one wrapper per classic asset, um, and anyone can actually create it because it just kind of mirrors and forwards, right? All right, so, so it's first come, first serve based, I mean, because there's an admin on, on the mm -hmm. wrappers, or how is it going? So the admin is on the classic asset, right? So, so the issuer? Yeah, the issuer. All right. Yeah, correct. It, it takes more the uh, DAG approach to it than the blockchain approach, so that works. Uh, now, my question is more along the lines of um, you, you're looking at FutureNet as a separate entity from Stellar or Vanilla, yeah. and at this point, I guess it's hard to say whether there'd be a merger in the future or whether there'd be two separate entities. I mean, that's the plan is to merge them in the future. In that case, uh, is there any uh, consideration for having Sargon actually work with other blockchains potentially? as a smart contract there on top of it. Has that even been looked at? Yes. Uh, so Sorbonne was designed from the ground up to be an implementation separate of Stellar, right? So there's Sorbonne and then there's kind of Stellar's usage of it, right? Um, so we've kind of added a few bits here and there to kind of do interoperability with Stellar, but the whole runtime is designed that you can take it out and, uh, and use it in different ways. Um, it's like a separate Rust crate from the rest of Core, right, that Core imports and uses the runtime from. Um, so yeah, hopefully others take it up as a kind of standard. It's actually a really nice development environment and a way to write smart contracts. So yeah. Um, the plan re uh, kind of FutureNet and TestNet and PubNet, um, I think Tomer said we'd like to have it live by the middle of next year at least, first half of next year, something like that on PubNet. Um, it's separate in FutureNet now so we can like reset the network if we need to, right? Like it's under development, we can change stuff. A lot of stuff is gonna change. Um, like if you go and write a smart contract now, you're gonna have to fix it in six months in some way, maybe small, maybe big, don't know, right? Um, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, oh, okay. One more for Moots and then uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could touch on the role of Horizon um, when sure. it comes to Sauron, because I know, at least in this example, the RPC was used exclusively, so. Yeah, I think um, the goal is that you shouldn't need to run a Horizon if you're just doing Sauron smart contract stuff. You should just be able to use Sauron RPC. Um, it has stuff, everything you need to like fetch the account sequence and balances. Uh, you might need to build a transaction uh, and then uh, actually just submit and simulate stuff. The place where Horizon can come in is like, so if we look at other ecosystems, right? Um, if you have like, let's say a Geth node for ETH, right? They have like an RPC thing, right? But if you want to actually do interesting queries about the network, you need like an indexer, right? So I think Horizon will become closer to like an indexer uh, where it, you can ask any question you want about anything on the network, but it, you know, you're going to pay the cost if you need to do that, right? Whereas if you just want to build transactions and submit stuff and like maybe you only care about events from your own contract, you know, that's like great. Then you can just use Sorbon RPC um, and like do that. There's also the reason we're adding the event subscribe uh, thing to Sorbon RPC is kind of different DAP architectures. One way is you subscribe to the events, you ingest them on your own, and you put them into your own database, and you can kind of then interpret them in the way that makes sense for your business logic and put them into a database. At which point you can serve transactions super quick because you've already like got everything in your local Postgres or whatever in the format you want. And it's much more like building a traditional web app at that point. So it's like easier to hire devs and like just easier to work with. There's more tooling in general. So that's why I think the event subscribe method is like the preferred way going forward. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I will be over there.
and then upstairs in the branded at 4 p.m. If there's any more questions or help, go try it. See how you go on. Let me know. Thank you.